Okay, I think that's probably given everybody enough time. Um, welcome to SR Europe's uh, first webinar. Uh, I'm Paul McDowell, President of the European Regional Chapter of SOIR, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all online uh, this afternoon. Our chapter members have joined us from all across Europe, including Dubai, Antwerp, Frankfurt, Warsaw, Paris, Newcastle, London, and even Lagos. We've also great pleasure in welcoming some of our uh, US and Canadian colleagues, including SIR Global President, Mark Duclos. Hi, Mark, I hope you're out there. And others from California, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Ontario, Louisiana, to name but a few. Our leadership has a clear strategy to build international growth. So please contact us if you're not yet a member but would like to join up. We're also incredibly pleased to have members from the Crew Network that's the corporate real estate for women with whom SOR collaborates to promote women in our industry. I'm here in sunny Dublin. Um, that will be the venue for the third SOR International European Conference. You'll no doubt know that this event sadly had to be canceled from July of this year and postponed through to July 2021 due to the COVID-19. Naturally, our thoughts, prayers and condolences or go out to those who have been affected by the pandemic through sickness or the loss of loved ones. Without the support of our members, and more particularly our sponsors, the conference would have been cancelled rather than postponed. So particular thanks to our platinum sponsor, Bank of Ireland, our gold sponsor, TSL, and Society of Charters Affairs Ireland, as well as the SIR Foundation, Axi Immo, Carter Jonas, Colliers, Corfac International, Finnegan Menton, FKM and Murphy Mill Hall, to name but a few. A bit of housekeeping now. Uh, all mics and videos have been turned off, but feel free to ask questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we will respond at the end of our presentation. Now, I would like to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Simon Stretch. Well, Simon yeah. is Hi, Simon. Simon is SOI Europe's PR consultant and runs our social media channels. Uh, so please do follow us if you're not doing so already. And last but not least, I would like to introduce our speaker, Anthony Slumbers. Hi, Anthony. Hello. Anthony is the globally recognized speaker, advisor, and writer on prop tech and space as a service. A serial entrepreneur, he has founded and exited several prop tech software companies and now consults real estate boards on their transfer, uh, transformation technology and innovation strategies. He writes an influential blog at anthonyslumbers.com and is a prolific tweeter. Anthony, over to you. Great. Thank you very much. Just give me a moment, please, everyone. I'm just gonna share my screen. So in a moment, you should see a present presentation and I'm gonna talk for about 20, 20 to 25 minutes. So I think we're all That's there. I think we're all okay there. Right. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the future of office, BC, AC. So BC, of course, is now before coronavirus, and AC is going to be after coronavirus. Now there was enough going on. There was enough going on BC, but um, we're going to get on to just how much AC is going to impact on everything everything from from there so the reason things were moving ahead very quickly the future was sort of flying towards us very fast and anyway before any of this hit was um the technology doesn't sleep so much of what's ha what's happening in terms of the speed of development is actually a, a function a function of te technology so this is this is an indication of what moore's law is is about moore's law is the the notion that for a given amount of cost, computing power doubles every eight, 18 months or so. And this is something that's held true for over 50 years, which is why this is the number of transistors on a computer chip. In 1980, there were 100,000 um, transistors on a chip. By 2000, it was 100 million. And then just 16 years later, it was 10 billion. So 100,000 to 10 billion in really not that not that long as soon as you start doubling big big numbers amazing amazing things happen 
And though lots of people say that this process is sort of coming, coming to an end, in fact, it isn't. Because if you look, there we are in 2016, we were up to 10 billion um, transistors on, on a trip, on a chip. This came out um, la last year. This is the Cerebras GPU. And this actually has, believe it or not, 1.2 trillion transistors on one chip. That's an awful long way from 100,000, isn't it? But this is why essentially everything's going so fast. But there is another reason it's going so fast is that alongside all of that, you've got the sheer scale of computational power at our disposal has actually grown even faster. In fact, much, much faster than Moore's law. Moore's law doubles every 18 months or so. The amount of computational power at our disposal has been doubling every three and a half months. So in 2012, if I could have bought one unit of computational power, by 2018, I could have had 300,000 units. So the amount of grunt at our disposal has increased between 2012 and 2018, 300,000 times. So it's no surprise things are happening. In fact, there's a trinity of transformation going on where we have a huge increase in data, we have a huge increase in computing power, and then we have huge advances in algorithms, particularly around deep learning. So these three, these, this trinity of tran transformation is driving things very, very fast. And that's why there are consequences. There is a so what of all, the, of all this speed. McKinsey, as far back, and it seems like ancient history now, January 2017, wrote this. We overestimate, we, overall, we estimate that 49% of the activities that people are paid to do in the global economy have the potential to be automated by adapting currently demonstrated technology. So half of the tasks that people in the world could do in 2017 could be automated by technology that already exists, not technology from the future, technology that already exists. And this is rapidly driving us towards an AI everywhere world. And the reason for that is that artificial intelligence, as described here by Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee in the Harvard Business Review, again of 2017, wrote that artificial intelligence, especially machine learning, is the most important general purpose technology of our era. And it's the three words, general purpose technology, that are the critical things here, because most technology is a, is a point solution. It deals with a particular thing. A general purpose technology is something that becomes pervasive throughout society. So for instance, the internal combustion engine is a general purpose technology. Electricity is a general purpose technology. The internet itself is a general purpose technology. Put artificial intelligence in the same context as being a general purpose technology and you start to get an idea the point is, this is something that is pervasive throughout business, society, through everything in, it, in our lives. Now, all of this is going to have a massive impact on real estate and was having a massive impact on real estate um, BC. Because what it is in effect doing is it is changing the very nature of the work we, of the work we do. And the way we work is being changed by the changing nature of the work we do. So essentially, anything that is structured, any task that is structured, repeatable or predictable will be automated. And that asterisk there is that is exactly what the 49% of tasks that McKinsey were referring to is about. Anything that is structured, repeatable, predictable is a bullseye for the machines in commerce and that will be automated. So that's all very well, but actually there's something missing from, in terms of the work we do from structured, repeatable, predictable, there's something missing from it. And of course, what's missing from it is creation. There is no creation, there's nothing structured, repeatable, predictable about creation. In fact, nothing can be made structured, repeatable, predictable until it has been created in the, in, the, in the first place. And in fact, Picasso, long time ago, ha had it absolutely right. He said, computers are useless. They can only give you answers. And this is the whole point. Humans are there to ask the questions. The machines can give us answers, but they can clearly 
answer a lot more things nowadays. So if you look at it, that any task that is structured, repeatable, predictable will be automated. In effect, that is becoming old work. It is no, 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 from our point, from a human's point of view, there is no value we can add, we can add to this. But if that's old work, what is new work? Well, new work is the obverse of what the machines are, are good at. It's what humans are good at as opposed to what computers are good at. And humans, unlike computers, are good at design, imagination, abstract and critical thinking, creation, innovation, empathy. Machines have no empathy. Now, unfortunately, we probably all met quite a lot of people who don't have a lot of empathy. But the point is, we have the capability to be empathetic. No machine is ever going to be em empathetic. And then collaboration, social intelligence, judgment. These are what humans are good at, and this is, this is new work. So the, the, the output of this is that an office that is designed around old work, and old work is structured, repeatable, predictable work, is or shortly will be obsolete because that work will no longer be in the building. So the future proof office has to be designed for new work. It has to be designed for design, imagination, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So offices, the point of an office is actually in the future as somewhere to catalyze human skills. So the real estate industry in many ways is no longer, is no longer about real estate because we are, in, we are in the office industry. So we think what our customers want is office, but actually no business wants an office. They're not interested in offices. They want a productive workforce. So who can deliver me a productive workforce? Which is why the whole ideas and notions and interest in user experience, what is the user experience of this space um, like, is becoming more and more important. So when user experience matters, who creates it matters. Now, we can create it, but it, the industry needs new skills, new people, and a new mindset to, um, to deal with um, creating great, great experiences. So the real estate company of the future was a company that had all the real estate skills of now, but knew about uh, internets of things because it needs to know how to set up networks, and needs to understand data, needs to understand workplace, needs to understand hospitality, needs to understand HR, because the job is to create a great user experience. And to be able to create and curate a great user experience, actually you need all, you need all, all these skills. And of course, Churchill in 1942 said, we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. But this, that actually was important in the context of the Houses of Parliament in 1942, but it's actually much more, much more important now. Because when, you're, when your job is to catalyze human skills, the shape of our buildings really, really matters. So that was all happening anyway. But that was then, that was BC, that was b before coronavirus. What happens now after coronavirus? Ooh, this is where it gets tricky because this actually does change everything. What people want in the future will not be what they wanted in the past. In fact, scratch out want, what people demand in the future will, be, will not be what they demanded in, in the past. Because there are two new zeitgeist changing norms that are, that are being developed under the current circumstances. So the first and probably the most important is the fact that outside my home can actually be quite scary. It can actually be quite dangerous and it can actually be quite unsafe. We are genuine, genuinely worried and concerned about the places and spaces we are, we are in or we are being asked to go into. But at the same time, the world has also discovered that it is actually the case that the whole globe can be impacted by the same thing at the, at the, same, at the same time. And this is going to come up in with climate, climate change as well. We've, we have actually realized that the whole world can, be, can actually be in it to get together. But the upside to this, the only probable upside to this is smell, smell the air. There's hundreds of millions of people around the world who are experiencing an air quality that they have never experienced before. This is the Himalayas. 
from Jalandhar, which is 200 kilometers away. And I'm told on, on great authority that this view has not been seen in 30 years. Genuinely, genu uh, generally, you cannot see the Himalayas from Jalandhar. You, you can now. And it's making people think, oh, that's interesting, if it can really make the, this, much, this much difference. So the pandemic is really upending, upending real, real estate. If you think, but think of it, we've had, we've had up until now really 10, 10 years of a bull market. Life has been pretty good in the real estate industry for the last 10 years. And companies have optimized for the world as it was. They optimized for the market as it was for a bull market, for a very strong market in, in demand, for not really needing to do, to do that much, frankly. Who needs innovation? I, I spend a lot of time in the, in the prop, prop tech area and prop tech people will, will always moan about the real estate industry is not very innovative or doesn't adopt technology. But frankly, I always say to them, you've got to remember it hasn't needed to. The real estate industry has been in a bull market and in a bull market, you optimize for what works best in a bull market. It didn't need a lot of innovation. Boom. This is where everything's changing because now our offices are empty. And we're suddenly realizing, or it brings to the, the fore, the fact that actually our customers never really like them very much anyway. If you look at sort of Leesman index, information where they ask the question, does your workplace enable you to be productive? Half the people say no. So half, half of our customers aren't really that impressed with our product anyway. It doesn't help, help them to be made productive. Now they've got a real problem. They're genuinely scared of them. How are we going to get people back into our offices when there's going to be lots, lots and lots of people there and they've got to touch things that everyone else is touching. They are genuinely scared of our buildings. This is, this is going to be an issue. And because we've been going through now months of the largest technological experiment in history, i.e. the experiment in remote working, the elephant in the room is that a lot of our customers have thought, hmm, well, maybe they don't actually need their office anymore. If you, if, you, if you look at the, the tech companies that are now saying, Twitter saying to people, don't come back. Google saying, come back next year sometime. Facebook going, oh, well, maybe, you know, half of you can come back. Goldman Sachs saying, do we need, do we need offices? Morgan Stanley saying, well, I'm not sure we need that many offices any, anymore. So we have, a, we have a situation where a lot of this stuff is happening anyway, and this has acted like a forcing function so all the changes that were going on in the market are being forced on us very, very, quick, very quickly with the added accelerant of this business about remote working and people understanding um, how much they can do by remote working. So this time is, diff is different. The real estate downturn playbook, so what do you do in a downturn in real estate has always been you cut your overheads, you cut your capex, you cut your expenditure, you hunker down and you survive. That's the whole point. Cut, 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 hunker down, survive. But boom, that's not gonna work this, this time. This time it genuinely is different. And the reason it's different is because the lack of demand is not a cyclical market issue. It's an existential health and safety one. People are worried about buildings. So the demand is changing. Not, is, the demand is there. It's just not necessarily for what, we, what we've got to offer. So this time, the only way through the crisis is actually going to be by spending money. You're not going to be able to cut your way through, through this crisis. You're going to have to spend your way through this crisis because you're going to have to stop people being scared of your space and make them want your space because they might not even need it. They might feel they don't even need it any, anymore. So we need to spend money and we need to spend money on upgrades to ventilation, ventilation systems, on new materials, on new hardware, on new fittings and furnishings, on new cleaning regimes, on new cleaning processes on communication, on data, on analytics, 
on interacting with our customers, on increased staffing, on looking at new business models and new ideas about what constitutes in the, off the office and even work itself. In a sentence, everything that we know we should have done over the last 10 years, but have not had to, so this is not a criticism of the industry because it has not had to, we actually need to do now. So to conclude from this, the point is indoor air quality is something that people are going to pay a huge amount of attention to. We've known about indoor air quality for 10, 15, 20 years. We've known it's been, it's been an issue, but it's never been such an issue that anyone's really needed to pay that much a pay that much attention attention to but now you're going to be in a situation of who's going to sign a long lease without specific items and clauses in there mandating indoor air quality of a certain quality or reporting about indoor air quality or analytics about indoor air quality if i was signing a long lease for a sizable company i would want to set the kpis of the air quality i want and I would want the landlord to be able to demonstrate to me every day across every area of every asset of every square foot or square meter that I'm taking that their building is a performing as it as it should do. So that's going to become a really big thing. We have discovered that there's few people who really need an office. Now this has been the case for quite a long time that we need to make people want an office rather than need it. I'm actually a great fan of offices, but I'm a great fan of offices that make me want to go to them. I don't need to be there. I can do my work anywhere, but where can I do my work, work best? And so we really need to concentrate on the want, not the need, which leaves you to offices are really about teams. There's no point in me going to an office, frankly, to have a meeting with myself all day. If I'm just going to sit there and work on my own all day, why am I going there? Offices are really for teams. They, they're, they're for teams, they're, not, they're for, uh, not for individuals because teams are more and more important the more and more we do human type work. And to catalyze human skills, that's going to be with teams in spaces that work best for teams. The office is distributed on a, on a sliding scale in the sense of however much remote working is um, becomes a thing it's going to become a thing at a, on a sliding scale for different companies in different sectors there will be certain types of company in certain types of industries that will still need a lot of people to be in the office a lot of the time but frankly that's not going to be that many because the only reason they really need to be in the office is either i need to meet my team or it has particular equipment that I don't have at, at home, or it has access to data in the office, which I can get at home, but that's not, such a, that's not such a huge market at the moment. So I'm pretty certain that the model going forward is going to be HQ, much shrunk, much, um, for, and, and designed for people to use one, two, three, three, three days a week. Thereafter, people will spend for, for basically for their, for their teamwork, for their individual work. Some people will have a setup at home that works. Mostly, I think we're going to be looking at a lot more, not work from home, but work from near home. And the whole office market is not particularly well suited for work from near home at the moment. So I think in terms of portfolio structure, in understanding where the employees of your major occupiers come from, where do they, where do they live? and what's near home to them and how can we serve them near home for two, three days, one, two, three days a week. And then the other rest of the time they come into the primary office. So there is definitely going to be a sliding scale of um, distri distributed work. Ultimately space, we're going to use a lot less of it, but it's going to be a lot better. In fact, it's going to be going to use much less of it, but it's going to be much better. And I envisage the likelihood in, in space is that fighting, fighting to keep selling the same amount of space for, to a particular occupier for a particular purpose 
is going to be really difficult. You're going to end up selling them a lot less space, but it's going to be much better space. It's going to have a lot more software and services built into it. And you're going to charge them, frankly, an awful lot more for it. So the mantra is, I don't want to sell you, let you as much space as I can for as long as I can. I actually want to sell you or lease you as little space as I can for as much as I can. So I envisage actually that the flex market, so the flex market is anything from co-working through to power, power by we type, type things when someone else comes and completely organizes your HQ for you. I think flex is going to become the market. I genuinely think, I don't know who's going to sign long leases, anything over five years. There will be some, but for the majority of the market, it's going to be on a flexible basis. And even the ones that sell leases, uh, sign long leases, is going to have a big component of flexible um, software and services um, built into it. So I think the, the, uh, the quicker we start uh, thinking of the office market is actually the flex market, or the flex market is actually the market, the, the better. Because this combination of thinking of an office as its hardware and its software and its services is, is the way, is the way to, to, to look at things now. We had just been selling people hardware. But hardware, i.e. just the real estate, that's just a dumb box now. Unless you can add software and services to it, it's just a dumb box. So whoever enables all of the above here is, is going to win. And I don't think you're going, to be able to, you're going to be able to win without addressing all of these issues. And as I say, whoever can enable it is in the best position to win. Thank you. I will now just unshare. Thank you, Anthony. That was a very enlightening talk, as predicted. Um, just a reminder to all participants that the Q&A channel is open, so we'd like to um, pass a few questions back to Anthony over the course of time. And um, in the meantime, I just want to run a couple of very quick straw polls that you can all see and answer online here before we get into um, challenging some of the um, issues and themes that Anthony raised there. And we'll give you just a few seconds. Um, Okay, that looks like we've had a good response. So it seems that um, the days of the 10 year lease are well and truly numbered. Uh, moving on to another quick one is what we think is the future for flex space. And we'll just give this another few more seconds. And again, strong confidence in the flex market as we move forward. And now addressing some of your specific points, Anthony, um, we have a question here. You mentioned air quality as being um, a key factor. Um, and we've had a question in asking why have you focused on air quality specifically when the virus is also spread through physical items? Uh, well, the, the reason for that is uh, that the virus, the virus is spread um, either from, from somebody, you know, most obviously either talking or um, 
or, or coughing or, or, or sneezing and it hang and it hangs in the air. I mean, that's why we have the, 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 the two meter rule that generally speaking, it, um, it falls, it falls to the ground before to, to two meters. And the point about air quality is if you have a, if you have an office building with, um, recirculating air conditioning and someone sneezes, <laughs> that could quite easily recir recirculate the virus around, around a whole building or a whole area very, very quickly. Yes, of course, it will settle on 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 phys physical items, and I'm, I don't mean to uh, ignore physical items. So you'll you'll see later. I said one of the things we have to spend more money on is uh, is cleaning techniques and processes and new materials. You know, there's a lot of sort of virus antibacterial materials that we can start using, and then there's also, of course, um, touchless te technologies. So so ways to, ways to to call the lift without. Uh, touching it to open a door without touching it so you know a lot of a lot of touchless um in areas where there's a lot of people is is going to become important so i i, I didn't mean to downgrade physical items but the the air quality is is the way things get spread really really quickly and we have another question in here from our vip guest mark duclo who is global president of sior so he's asking if we are leasing less space, um, but more suitable for today's world, how does that balance in balance with social distancing and density? To that, what do you believe will be the traditional space person ratio? My, my, my honest answer to this is I think until, until we are unconcerned about social distancing we have a we have a problem in getting people back into the office. Um, I think the idea of running an office at social distancing, the whole six feet office, and let's all let's all go to the office to spend two say two meters apart is frankly ludicrous. It's just not not going to happen. In the short term, however long the short term is, I think managing managing social distancing is going to be a function of buildings operating at 20 30 40% capacity. If you go in, if you go into Hong Kong now, the buildings are up to 60 70% capacity, but they don't do they don't do social distancing. But they very often wear masks. So they might they might sit, you know, you you can you can adjust workplaces so people don't sit on top of top of each other, but if you go into a meeting you'll find they're all, they're all sitting there sitting there in mass. So I think in the in the short term, the density is going to be a function of just we're not going to have that many people back in the office. Longer term, longer term, I think what is more likely to happen is, as I say, people will use uh, less space, but better space. But a part of the better space might be that it has actually a lower density. So if I'm going to meet my meet my team, I might meet my team in a space which is twice as large as I might use if I was going there to work at my work at my desk, simply because I can create a, a, a better environment. I think in many ways that the space person ratio sort of falls away when people aren't expected to be in the office nine to five every day, sitting at their desk, tapping away at a computer. When you're going to an office to do more human, human work, um, I think the space ratios might go up, but there's, there's absolutely no way, as I've heard a number of people say, oh, well, we're going to need more space, so companies are going to have to lease more space. There's zero chance of that happening. The, the reason, the way you get a lower dense, uh, a better, a larger amount of space is by having less people in the building at, at, the, at, at a time. And I think that's going to be a function of people going into a building for a particular purpose to meet to meet a team or a customer or to do a particular thing and in an in an environment which is spatially spatially optimized for that okay and for those who do embrace more of a home working um pattern um do you think there'll be an expectation that good employers will contribute towards employees home office Hundred percent, hundred percent, yes. <laughs> uh, absolute hundred percent, yes. Already happens. You look at any of the companies that are set up 
um, with a lot of remote remote working, it becomes part of part of the deal. I mean, a friend, a friend of mine in New York was was writing something the other day, and he's saying, and if you think, well, the average person is um, costs something like in Manhattan seventeen thousand dollars a year to to put at a desk in an office building. Well, how about spending half of that on making sure that they've got the you know don't give them cut their space in half and spend half of it giving them a better computer, better software, better services, better access to tools, better access to internet con connectivity. An absolute prerequisite of a successful remote strategy is having employees working in good environments with excellent technologies, with access to the very best tools. In fact, much better tools than they get in the office. I mean, part of the problem with the office, as it's been over the last few years, is actually people walk into an office and then they have to downgrade themselves in technology terms. So, no, ab absolutely, you must, but it's not a, you, the, the whole fundamental point, if you think about all of this at a macro, real, real estate at a macro level, this isn't about us not using space. It's about us using different spaces in different, in different ways. So as a totality, the real estate industry has lots of needs to, to support. If I'm not in an office and I work for you, you still need to support me somewhere. So that, as I say, that might be a work from home. It might be, it might, might be a work at, at home, but ab absolutely remote work is not an excuse to whoopee, this is a way we can save loads of money. That's not, that's not the game here. And when you mention some of the firms, Google, Facebook, Goldman Sachs and the like, who are uh, dramatically moving towards a work from home model, I mean, do you think it really is possible for any large organization to work completely devoid of office infrastructure? Pers personally, I think there are very few companies that can work completely devoid of offices. Um, the ones that do exist um, tend to be tech companies. And in fact, the, 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 the companies that um, are saying that they're going to do more re work, remote work ten are tending to be the, the tech companies. But they're very much designed from the ground up to be, to be remote. So if you take a company like called GitLab, um, they are probably the biggest purely remote company. They have something like 1,200 employees in 67 countries, and they have, no, they have no offices. But they have a huge organizational structure and architecture and infrastructure in place to support and promote that way, that way, of, that way of working. They are also, of course, have from day one only hired people who wanted to work in, in, in such, such a way. The, re the, rea the reality is, for some people, the office is a wonderful place. For other people, it's a, it's a, it's a nightmare place. For some people, it's a very productive place. For some people, it's an unproductive. For some, it's efficient. For some, it's inefficient. For some, it's effective. For some, it's ineffective. The key point here is actually trying to break down your, your company into what is required to enable us to be as productive, as effective, and as efficient as we, as we can possibly be, whilst satisfying the wants, needs, and desires of our employees, who are not going to become any less important to us. Because this point about the machines are taking half the, half the, the tasks, that still leaves half the task to do, and the humans are still the people, and will still be the people for quite a long time, essentially guiding and telling the machines what to do. So in human, human skills are actually becoming more valuable in a more technological world. So people need to be supported, they need to be understood, and I think that the, the, the smarter companies will start to really structurally look at the type of people they employ, what their needs are, how are they satisfied, and then we'll start devising real estate strategies that 
I was going to say, I don't want to say tick all the boxes, but actually look at all these things in a very granular, in a much more granular way and think, well, how can I optimize for that team there? How can I optimize for that team there? What mix of remote, distributed, HQ, work from home, et cetera, suit, suits them? It's a, it's, 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 this is not a, you can't just take, a, 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 an office bound company and move it remote without making changes that won't work there's a whole load of organizational structural um change cultural changes that need to happen so i i still i think you will find most companies will offer between uh, i think i think most people will work at least one day one day a week remotely and and maybe maybe build up from there but it, it's a movable feast and it's very particular to your types of customer and you know given a number of the concerns you raised and have, have been raised elsewhere about density do, do you see employers um taking sort of multiple smaller spaces rather than perhaps the large or, or even alongside um a larger hq space the hub and spoke model well, it's, it's quite interesting, actually. I, was, uh, I listened to um, a webinar a while ago with the head of the global head of real estate for Uber. And you can imagine Uber have got places all, all over the world. And what he was saying, which, well, he said two things which I thought made an awful lot of sense. The first, in terms of what is the form factor of an office going to be? And he simply said, I don't know. He said, we're going to work it out. We're, we'll see what happens, see how things work, and then we will adjust ac accordingly. I, you don't know yet. You've got to feel your way across the river by touching the stones, as, as Mao, Mao used, used to say. It's a movable feast. But the other thing he said is that he thought what would actually happen is that they would reduce the number of offices they have, but make them bigger. So they would concentrate on a smaller number of larger HQ buildings of a higher spec serving, serving a pretty large area, but with lots of, that were of a scale that enabled them to produce a lot of things that employees could get in that building that they couldn't get at home and work on the basis that these larger buildings, if you could get to them, then you, you may or may not come into them. You'd have a mix of, of, in and out. Otherwise, if you weren't able to access these bigger offices, then work remote. So very, very much in sort of reducing it down to major, maybe core cities. And then for the secondary cities, they just wouldn't bother. They'd say, well, work remote on the second, secondary, secondary cities. But in terms of, in terms of distributed portfolios, abs absolutely. I can certainly see if you take L London here, and you think of all the commuter, the commuter towns around, around London. So I'm, I live about 30, 30 miles south of, south of London and thousands of people go, tens of thousands of people go up and down five, five days a week, which is frankly quite, quite ludicrous. But there's an awful lot of people who want to go two days a week or three, day, or three days a week. But I would love it if... I, I, I can see there being employees who provide space in town and out of town. So lend, lend, lend lease in, Austra in Australia have this product called, what do they call it? The local office. And they have this, their big development, Barangaroo in, in Sydney, massive, massive, very high tech, wonderful, top, top of the heap, um, office uh, mix, but primarily office complex. But they, have, they, they are starting to do deals with tenants there that they take space in downtown Sydney, but Lendlease would build them various local offices in locations where their offices, their, where, their employ, where their customers' employees work. So the employees can, mainly are encouraged, Lendlease still want to encourage people to go into, into CBD Sydney, but if you want to go into a Lendlease space which comes with the lease of the Sydney one, locally by all means go go and work there so we're going to see a lot more um a lot more split up portfolios 
And we have a, a couple of interrelated questions um, coming here. One is, um, do you see HR becoming more involved in real estate decisions? Um, which leads on to perhaps a, a broader question, which is applicable to, to many of our participants here today, which is, you know, we've talked about this seismic change in, in the way we use office space and the product it needs to deliver. And what does that mean for the role of the, the office agent or the broker or the corporate real estate advisor? Uh, let's just deal with, deal with the, the HR thing um, first. Yes, please. I mean, it, 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 it's famously the case that the workplace industry and the HR industry are both involved with creating workplaces for their employees, but they don't talk to each other. You know, you have HR, HR conferences and workplace conferences and never the twain shall meet. And this is, this is part of my whole thesis here that we've, we've got like six industries involved with creating a great user experience to enable my customers' employees to be as productive as they can possibly be. They need real estate, they need an internet, they need a network, they need data, they need analytics, they need HR, they need workplace, they need hospitality. And please, can someone put all that stuff together? Because at the moment, we've got disparate industries doing very good jobs but they're all trying, they're all aiming to get to the same end point, but through, through parallel, parallel worlds. They all had to work, work together. So leading on from there to the role of an office broker, I think clearly my attitude is the notion of leases is going to get more and more irrelevant, but the importance of matching a company to the right space that provides the right hardware, software, and services is increasingly um, highly valued. And I think what a lot of the agents, brokers will really be paid for in the future is not helping me wade through this ludicrous hundred page document called a lease. And then every three, five years, having a ritualized argument with the landlord, it's going to be on it helping, a, helping a company choose real estate and real estate services that are appropriate for them. And that's a, that's a, that, that is a, di that is a different, a different skill, but the value of that, Goes, goes way, way up. Because all of everything I'm talking about is predicated on, you know, the, the, the 330, 300 line of three euros is on your uh, utilities, 30 euros is on your rent, and 300 is on your people. My attitude to real estate is, yes, pay attention to the three and the 30, but treat that treat that at the ratio it is to the 300 of the people. So if you can spend, real estate needs to spend a lot more time thinking and proselytizing and evangelizing for the reason you pay us is because we're gonna help your people be as productive as they can possibly be. And there's a large component of that, of enabling that, is within the remit of where they where they sit and where they do their work okay and just just to wrap up moving on from that i think when you talk about this holy trinity of the hardware software services and that premium product um do we have any evidence yet that occupiers are willing to pay the premium and what you know what's the likely impact on on rental values uh do we have evidence that people pay for really good real estate? I think we probably do. I think we probably do. What, what do people pay per square foot in a WeWork? Triple what they pay on a rent. <laughs> now, I'm not, I'm not saying that's the solution because I don't, I don't think, as I say, I don't think the end, the end of this is actually going to be, I think more and more we're not going to be selling per square foot. We're going to be selling per other K KPIs. Because the per square foot thing 
gets you down to well the only the only way you can make more money is you um is you you shrinkflation it so you just give people you you say you sell them a desk and but a desk is on 50 square feet rather than 150 um it, it, is is there evidence well i th i think it's really interesting if if you look at if you look at the flex the flex market over the last few years now and look at the 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 unity the unit economics of what you pay to be in a flex operator than if you were to take a 20 year lease for instance it's a lot more expensive to be in a flex flex operation um at at a unit eco, eco, economics point, point of view but that has been a huge amount of the market the the, the last few years I, I to be honest i sort of think about this the the other way around I sort of think of this more from the case of, well, you try and let, you try and let a not very interesting, not very human, not very environmentally uh, capable building, and see how much money you can get out get out of that. I think I think there's almost a there's almost a negative thing here. Of there's a lot of space you will not be able to let. You know, you can you can sort of think well i don't need to provide any of these services and my argument is that increasingly your customer will go that's fine that's your option in that case i just don't want it it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a movable it's a movable feast but 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 part part actually there there is one fundamental point here a lot of what i'm arguing of course comes with a great deal of analytics so in terms of environmental conditions and occupancy and utilization and um, help desk requests and attractivities and day, days off sick and those sorts of things, the, the better the space is, the better all of those things are going to be able to perform. And so you are going to be able to say, well, I, I can prove to you that my building has been operating at optimal environmental conditions all, all, all the time. So as far as far as the building is involved, this building is not doing any harm at all to the productivity of your of your people, as opposed to other people who say, well, often that's that's not not the case. Good. And before I let you completely off the hook, we've just had one last um, person <laughs> question in, and then I shall hand you back over to Paul. But um, Going back to um, your earlier session on automation, a, a question's come in asking, if some jobs can be automated at 50%, then how should we use half of this remaining office space? Um, I, well, pretty well globally there's um, housing problems, aren't there? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, the, 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 the point is, the 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 point is a the, the 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 total envelope of real estate is not going to change it's what is what you use it what you use it for so there are other ways there are other ways of you using space and this is the fundamental real estate situation isn't it if i if i can if i can create space if i can let you half of, half of the space if i have assets where I can let you half of the space but charge you three quarters of what you used to pay, but you'd be happy. If I could do that across my portfolio, then I'm, then I'm financially well on the right, right side. Does that mean that other people are not going to be able to do that and are not going to be able to see a return on their office? Well, that's what happens, isn't it? You know, if, 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 if your office space isn't, isn't lettable, that's what we're in the real estate development business for. Redevelop it. <laughs> That's the point. That's what a lot of our skills are. We're developers. Develop it. <laughs> Neatly argue, argued. It's potential everywhere. Thank you very much, Anthony, and thank you for um, working your way through those questions. So I shall now hand back over to Paul, who will um, close out the session. Thanks very much, Simon. And... Uh, 
There are a few questions I'm afraid we didn't reach there, so apologies to those ones that we didn't get to. Um, but uh, we wanted to keep to the time slot that we'd allocated and wrap this up smartly within the hour. So it just remains for me to say thank you, Anthony, for a fascinating insight into the office of tomorrow or what is now going to become probably the new normal. As you said, many of these trends are already there. The COVID-19 has just accelerated the pace. And hopefully this will work out eventually in a good way for us all. Uh, a copy of this recorded webinar is available online after this uh, session closes. Last but not least, our, many th our thanks to the many participants who joined us today from all over uh, SOI Europe for SOI Europe's first webinar. And please join us again next month, details to be announced. In the meantime, stay safe and stay well. And in the words of our famous Irish poet, the late Seamus Heaney, if we winter this one out, we can summer anywhere. Rather <laughs> apt, I think, today. Thank you and goodbye.